I want to start this morning with a little bit of ministry. I know usually we build the ministry, but I believe to start with ministry. And the thing that's been on my heart all morning since I was up very, very much earlier this morning than I had planned to be um, is to minister to the weary. Because I know there's many who are weary in the battle right now. But I, want, I, was, I was praying into it this morning and from a place of compassion and, and, and wanting to speak strength, and, and, and I will over everybody. But for everybody here, everybody online who's weary in the battle, I want to give you the word the Lord gave me. We're weary because we're winning. We're weary because it's working. We're weary because we're taking territory. We're weary because we're putting one step in front of the other. Now we're weary, I get it. But you know, some of the greatest hikes when I lived in Montana for all those years, and whether it was my first hike every spring up Mount Aeneas to see the wildflowers on the other side where the snow melted first, or if it was up in Glacier National Park to, to climb to a new peak, and you know, these were paths and stuff. I wasn't like free climbing. Um, but some of them were quite, you know, quite aggressive climbs. And I would be weary by the time I got to the top because I'd use my muscles because I'd exercised my lungs, because you know some of the places I had to push and stretch a little bit to get to. But when I would stand on those peaks and look at the glory of the Flathead Valley, the weariness was not a, oh, I'm weary. The weariness was a, I did it. And I want you to know you're doing it. And I'm not making light of if you're weary. I understand on days I'm weary, but we're weary because it's working. The enemy's lying and saying, you're weary because you're just beating your head against the brick wall. You know what? For a while we were, but cracks came into that wall. And then that wall started to crumble. And now we're stepping over the rubble and we're taking the glory out and we're covering the United States of America and your nations as well that you're praying for out there. We're covering it in the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. And I break weariness off of you, but I give you and release to you the spoils of all that you've accomplished. And Lord, I'm asking that for all who are weary, you would meet us right now and you would pour out your love, your grace, and your ease. God, I thank you that even as your son came out of 40 days in the desert winning an amazing battle on our behalf, that when he was weary, you sent angels and he wasn't weary because he'd failed. He was weary because he'd won an incredible victory. So, Lord, I thank you that you encourage your people. You send angels to minister, to refresh, to strengthen your people. God, I ask that you would even in the spirit send a battle report to show each and every one how much territory they've taken, how much freedom in you has been established, how much light has broken forth through the darkness, God. Encourage them with a battle report of the victories that they've agreed with and the territory that's being taken. Some of the other things I saw specifically in this, this morning was, um, well, I forgot to start with the scripture, Galatians 6, 9, that says, do not grow weary in doing good. And this morning, the the Lord gave me such a great revelation of this. I've always thought of that as kind of a nudge to keep going, keep doing good, don't get weary. And it does mean that. It means we should always be putting forth our our strength in Christ to be doing good in the earth. But this morning, I read it a whole differently. It was like God speaking a blessing of, you will not grow weary in doing good. Do not grow weary. Grow excited in the good that you are doing. So I speak the encouragement of God over you and declare that the weariness is breaking off. I come against everything of the enemy that's attempting to come against you and come against you. Anywhere the enemy's trying to discourage, I break that off of you. I break off witchcraft, I break off curses, I break off everything the enemy is trying to send to weigh you down in Jesus' name. And I declare you are not being weighed down, but you are being lifted up. In Jesus' name. And Lord, we do. We break witchcraft off. We break curses off. We break off everything in the enemy. Any kickback, any lashback, any counterattack. And right now, wherever the enemy has come against you, I speak confusion into the enemy's camp. And I declare the enemy will turn upon itself and be destroyed. And Lord, I thank you that our weapons are not carnal, but they are mighty in you for the pulling down of strongholds. So devil... You, you lose no matter what. Because even if we are a little weary in our flesh, we can still pray and our weapons are just as mighty in God. Because we don't war in our strength, we war in his strength. So Lord, I thank you 
that you give a little R&R this week, a little respite, a little resuscitation, a little revival, a little reformation to each of us as a taste and an encouragement of what we're releasing into the earth and into our nations to your glory, Jesus. So weariness be gone, encouragement and strength come in Jesus' mighty name, amen. Oh, you guys are such champions. We're gonna see such a great move of God. We are in the midst of such a great move of God. We really are. It's going to be awesome. So what I want to do this morning is the word I have for you, um, I decided to entitle, What Will It Take? And it's based on an encounter I had with God kind of out of the blue last Monday night. And the Lord spoke to me. It was, um, it was, it was, a, it was a word of this season. And you, I'm sure you guys have all noticed how God's tone has changed in this season. Um, and I want to encourage you, if you haven't watched our show called God's Tone Has Changed, you can go to my YouTube channel. It's one of the Heroes Arise shows. I really encourage you to watch it because it'll give you a really great understanding of why we're getting so many really heavy warning words. But Because God's tone has changed. God is trying to get our attention. God is trying to highlight to us the incredible opportunity we have in him right now to make a radical difference in the earth and to truly see revival and reformation break out in our nations. Yes, God's tone has changed, but what we must remember is God's tone has changed, but God has not changed. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if God has issued a warning word, it's not because he's changed and now he's mad at us and wants to smite us. He's still the same God who saves, who heals, who delivers, who revives, who reforms. This is the same God that when all of us were completely given over to sin, you think it's dark now, there was a time when all of us were completely given over to sin, and that's when he sent his son into the earth on our behalf. God is not, how do I want to say this, Lord? I don't want to misrepresent you. I was about to say God is not put off by the darkness that's in the world. And truly, he's not, actually. He doesn't like it. He's not for it. But it doesn't intimidate him. So God's tone has changed, not because he now is the God who smites and punishes, because now he's the God who's irritated. No, his tone has changed because he wants to get the attention of his people that know who he is and what he's like so that we can become his difference makers and solution bringers in the earth. God's tone has changed, but God has not changed. I watched another really heavy warning word that somebody brought out this past week, and it's amazing, since God gave me this revelation about, yes, my tone has changed, but I have not changed. Now when I hear these words, I feel the heaviness of them, I, I feel the weight of them, but I hear them as simply an alarm clock going off. It's not, this is what's coming, duck and cover. The Lord, when I see these words now, I hear it as the Lord saying, this is what you will stand against. This is what we will say no to. And we will see victory come forth if we will wake up. I put out a, a, a word this morning. I'm sure many other, or not this morning, sorry, this week. Um, I've been developing these little, what are the things on the internet with the pictures called memes? Yeah, so I'm, I'm creating memes. Um, I didn't know what a meme was a few months ago. Now I'm creating them almost every morning. Um, but I put this one out. That was a, it was a really cool picture of a church in this deep fog as the sun was coming up. And the little, the little header I put on it was, to see a great awakening in the land, we must first see a great awakening in the church. And the good news is we're seeing it. You know how I know? I'm looking at it. I'm looking at a great awakening in the church. I'm looking at a great awakening in the church. I'm looking at champions. I'm looking at warriors. I'm looking at revivalists and, re and reformers because from our prayer chairs, we can be that. I am so proud in this moment to not only be part of the body of Christ, but to be part of Shiloh Fellowship. You are God's answer. You are God's solution. You are God's remnant. And many brothers and sisters around the world are as well. This is a time for hope. It's a time for seriousness. It's a time to be aware of the situation in the earth. It's a time to know that there is darkness in the earth and deep darkness in the people. There is darkness in the USA and deep darkness in this nation. But you know what that means? It's our time to arise and shine for our light has come. So we don't deny the darkness, but we don't become overwhelmed by it. We overwhelm it. We stand in who our light is that has come. We stand in his victory. We shake off the weariness. And even if it's for a moment and say, Lord, in this moment, 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on you. I'm going to make my decrees. I'm going to make my prayer points. Ah, then I'm going to sit back and I might take a nap afterwards, God. But I'm going to stand and I'm going to do it. This is a time for hope. This is a time for excitement. It is a time for awareness. That's why God's tone has changed. And sometimes, even with the weighty warning words we're getting, it is an alarming tone. But you know why it's alarming? Just like an alarm clock. What if an alarm clock in the morning was like, good morning. If you feel like it, you can get up anytime you'd like. This is, this is an invitation to consider getting up and maybe getting on with your day. No, the alarm clock goes, eh, 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 and we try to reach for it and hit snooze, and it comes back, eh, 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 eh. The alarm clock is not angry. It does not want to smite. It does not want to destroy. It wants to get our attention so we can get up, get about our day, and make a difference in the world that we're dominion stewards in. That's why God's tone has changed. So this past week, Monday night, actually, Monday evening, and this was not, this was I, 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 what I was doing. I was brushing my teeth, getting ready for bed. I was not thinking about the Lord. I wasn't thinking about anything. Um, I think I was thinking about, I, I want to go, I want to read and go to bed. I think I was trying to think about what I was going to read. Um, and all of a sudden, the voice of the Lord clearly spoke. And this is what he said. The blood of martyrs will cry out one way or another. And it rattled me because there was weight to it. And I realized this is an alarm clock word. I'm not a blood of martyrs guy. I'm a goodness of God guy. And I was, I was rattled. So I spit out the toothpaste, rinsed my mouth out, went and sat in my prayer chair. And I don't remember the exact words I used, but it was something like, Lord, what the heck? And he started to unpack for me, and he began in Revelation 6, where it talks about how the blood of martyrs cries out. Let me read that to you. Oh, I had it, and I moved it. Give me just a second to get to Revelation 6 in my new living. That's the, I, I do a lot in the Passion. I do a lot in NASB when I study, but my, my day in, day out, devotional Bible tends to be this old new living. And I call it the old because it's out of print now. And I love it. I love it. They've changed some phrases here and there, but I love how this puts it. So here's, here's Revelation 6, 9 in the New Living. I saw under the altar the souls of all who had been martyred for the word of God and for being faithful in their witness. They called out to the Lord. And as you read on, it's they're calling out to the Lord for justice, for righteousness to be established in the land. And I read that, and this is talking about the literal blood of martyrs. And I started to be like, Lord? But what was interesting is I could feel the weight, and the Lord wanted me to feel the weight that the blood of martyrs has. When the blood of martyrs cries out, God hears and God responds. But before Anything other than, I, I, before, before fear could grip me, all of a sudden he started to speak to me of Acts 1.8. In Acts 1.8, you all know this, as charismatics, we love this. It says, this is the victorious risen Lord who has won all, done all, and is given all. The victorious risen Lord who has come up out of the grave to invite us to discipleship, to be dominion stewards in the earth to the glory of our victorious God. He declares this, the Holy Spirit will come upon you in power so you can be my witnesses, mighty witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. Holy Spirit will come upon you in power to be my great and mighty witnesses here, there, and everywhere. And you think, what does that have to do with the blood of martyrs? That word witness in the Greek is martos. It's the exact same word as martyr. And so the Lord started speaking to me and all of a sudden I shifted from the first thing that he said, which is the blood of martyrs will cry out to the second thing he said, one way or another. And I could feel God saying, we are in a situation, it is going to take the blood of martyrs to shift things. Yet, 
He's letting us know that if we're willing to do what he's always planned for us, which is not only in saying yes to him, embrace the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to be his martyrs everywhere we go, what that means is Holy Spirit will come upon us in power so that we can die to ourself. Die to selfishness, die to distraction, die to murmuring and complaining, die to bitterness and offense, die to our carnal reactions to things. I'm preaching to me as much as anybody this morning and allow Holy Spirit to empower us to do what? Arise and shine for our light has come and the glory of the Lord is upon us and the kingdom of God will arise in us when we participate in this. Or if we've done the wrong thing, we shake it off and say, oh God, that, that irritation and frustration didn't do any good. So I'm gonna let Holy Spirit come upon me in power. I'm gonna die to myself and come fully alive in you. If you're thinking, are you sure it means that? My short answer is yes. But I wanna give you a scriptural example because I think we should root everything in scripture. In John 20, starting in verse 19, but going on through that passage, we see the disciples go through this exact thing and Jesus do this exact thing. So before we get to verses 21 and 22, let me give you a little context. Everything has gone pear-shaped to the understanding of the disciples. Nothing went the way they thought it was going to go. They didn't realize the greatest victory that's ever been won has just been achieved, and all of hell and all of death and every bit of darkness has been overcome. They saw something as a defeat. If you think some of the policies in our nation that need to be reversed are a defeat, they're nothing compared to overcoming hell and death itself. He's well able, and in him we're well able to overcome this. So they're freaked out. They are metaphorically and literally locked up in fear. In verse 19, it says something like, and, the, and the, the disciples were in the upper room behind locked doors because they were afraid. Then we get to verse 21 and 22, where the victorious risen Lord steps through the walls, and it says, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. Before I go on, let's pause it. Peace be with you. So the victorious risen Lord steps through the walls and says, peace be with you. That sounds nice, doesn't it? If we don't understand this in the original language, we can misinterpret it. Jesus was not just showing up and saying, may the chill of God come upon you, bro. I know it's a stressful time, but I'm here, man. Just, just cool it out a little bit, baby. We'll be good. No, that's not what he's saying. Surfer Jesus wasn't showing up. The victorious, risen Lord showed up. And when he says, peace be unto you, that word in the Greek, which, which is translated from the Aramaic, is irene. And here's one of the ways it can be translated. The devout, the, wait, the blessed state of a devout and upright man after death. So Jesus is saying, I know you're freaking out, guys. I know you don't understand. I know it looks and feels dark, but here's the key. I won, and I'm with you. So now I'm releasing my peace, my irene. Let's go back to peace. I'm releasing the grace to you to die to yourself. So John, Peter, James, rest in, well, me, the Prince of Peace, rest in peace because you're part of the solution. So I'm giving you a grace to hurry up and die to yourself so you can come fully alive in me and go out there and make the radical difference in the world you are recreated for in me and you were originally planned for. That's why he goes on to say, after Jesus said to them, here's the grace to die to yourself, to die to that fear that's keeping you locked up in here instead of going out there and making the radical difference in a society and a world that desperately needs you to move in light and power, Here's the grace to die to yourself. How do we know? What's the next thing he says? Because as the Father sent me, I am ministering to you so you can stay here. As the Father sent me, so am I sending you. Because you're made to go out there and make a difference. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to the receive who? 
the Holy Spirit. It's Acts 1.8. We're seeing an example of exactly what Acts 1 8 is to each of us. The Holy Spirit will come upon you to empower you to walk in the Irene, to get past fear, to get past doubt, to get past discouragement, all of which I understand if I watch the news too much. I can't tell you how many times a day I need Irene. So and so did what? Mrs. What's her name said what? Oh, oh, wait, Irene, die to myself, die to frustration. That is the blood of martyrs that will cry out. Lord, I don't want to respond as me. I want to walk for you. Lord, help me die to fear. Help me die to discouragement. Let's get real. Help me die to anger and hate and bitterness and murmuring and complaining because they're driving me crazy, man. No, Lord, help me die to that so I can come fully alive in you. What God was speaking to me Monday night that rattled me at first, by the time we unpacked it together, I was filled with hope and excitement. He's saying, yes, we're in a situation where it's going to take the blood of martyrs, but I'm not taken by surprise. I am not discouraged. I am not undone. I am no less victorious, and neither are you. And what can we can do is right now, we can do exactly what we're doing. This isn't even a challenge word to you all. This is a word of encouragement. This is a word of honor because it's what Shiloh Fellowship all over the globe is doing. We're choosing to grab hold of our victorious Lord. We're choosing to die to ourselves. If we get caught up in a little fear or frustration or discouragement or despair or depression or anger, if we get caught up, and I caught myself murmuring and complaining last week. So you know what I did? I went to my pastors and confessed it. And I said, you know what? I want to apologize. I released the wrong thing. I had, a, I had a silly moment. I had a flesh moment. I had a carnal moment. I had a Robert moment. And that's not going to do anything but release darkness. And I want to be, I, I want to confess it out loud. And I want to be held accountable. Check in with me. What was I doing? I was letting the blood of martyrs cry out. I was dying to myself and saying, you know, God's not condemning me for this. And God's not disqualifying me for this. What I'm doing is I'm dying to my old carnal nature. And the blood of martyrs is crying out because I know I'm part of the solution. I'm not disqualified or put to the sideline because I made a mistake. I'm choosing to go, this is not who I am. This is not the solution. So God, help me die to that. Because that was just a carnal thing. And help me come fully alive in you. So now, when I see these things, I arise and shine. And I operate in love and mercy and grace and truth. And I decree truth. And I stand for righteousness and justice. But I do it in the very character and nature of him who is righteousness and justice. Because that will shift things. So Jesus was saying, I'll, I'll sum it up with this. This is how I wrote it out at the end. We are being given an invitation to lay down our lives in and for Christ in this season. But here's the heavy. If we choose not to, we may be coming to a place in the USA where devastation is coming into the church where we, real, we will literally have to lay our lives down for the gospel. I believe that's what all the heavy warning words that are coming are all about. God is showing us that this is Satan's plan. I think of like um, Katie Souza. Um, I've done some media with her recently where we unpacked a very serious warning word the Lord gave her. And you might have seen Patricia and I do one with her or she did a Heroes Arise with me. I was on her show Faith with Katie where we unpacked it. If you haven't seen it, watch it. It's a serious word specifically about what could come to the church. But it's not a word of defeat. It's a, it's, it's a word where God is saying, this is what Satan wants to do, but for my champions like Shiloh Fellowship, he's not going to get to because we're going to let the Holy Spirit come upon us so we die to ourselves, so we die to those carnal reactions and we come fully alive in Christ and we become part of the solution as opposed to part of the problem. That's the blood of martyrs that he wants to see cry out right now where we die to ourselves and come fully alive in him. He has no desire to see it come to where we're literally laying down our lives. What we need to do is wake up. 
That's the warning words. It's an alarm clock. But it's not an alarm clock to duck and cover. It's an alarm clock to get up and be about his business, which, by the way, is so joyful, is so hopeful. Like I've said, every time I pray the Firewall USA prayers, no matter how I feel going into it, when I let Holy Spirit come upon me to empower me to die to myself and die to, I don't want it. It's not going to make any difference. Wah, 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 wah. And just go, okay, Lord, give me a nudge. I feel like I'm on a sled on the top of the hill. Just give me a nudge. Get me going. I'll get going. And he does. I'm not a couple minutes into the Firewall USA prayers. I'm like, it's not a burden. It's not, a, oh, I'm dying. My, I am coming alive in Christ. I am realizing, oh, this is what I'm made for. This, I don't desire fear. I don't desire discouragement. I desire life. I desire light. I desire victory. And I have it. And now I'm expressing it. That is the blood of martyrs that can turn things around in this hour. So we must lay down our lives for Christ in this season or we may, we may well see devastation and persecution coming to the church in this nation to where we become literal martyrs for the Lord, but we don't need to. And by the way, laying down our lives is core to our Christian faith. And, and again, this is not a heavy because why would I want to live as Robert from zero to 38 and a half? All I did was make, walk around in a muck and mire of self. But at almost 39, when the God I'd mocked and made fun of showed up outside my cabin in the woods of Montana and said, I refuse not to love you, and came flooding at me with his love and his acceptance so that the next day when I had another encounter with him, I gave my life to him. Oh my gosh, I have, when I catch myself like I did last week, I didn't go to Pastors Francisco and Desiree to say, I'm a horrible, I'm just, I'm just a low down dirty dog. I just, I'm, I'm everything that's wrong with the world. No, I said, look, I did something that I want to confess out loud. It wasn't part of the solution. And I want to clean it up. I want to cover it in the blood. I want it removed as far as for the east is from the west because I am made to be the solution. I am a son, and I thank you for coming alongside of me in this hour. Hold me accountable. Check in with me, because this isn't who I am. Why would I not want to die to myself? I, I said that poorly. I think that was like a, at least a double negative. Why, why wouldn't I want to come alive to who I truly am in Christ? That's what dying to self, I've, I, I'm translating it as this now, dying to selfishness. That's what we're doing when Holy Spirit comes upon you. Let me walk us through some scriptures really quickly here to show that laying down our lives is core to our Christian faith. I want to start with one of our favorite charismatic scriptures. I love this scripture. John 14, 12, where Jesus says to us, Verily, verily, I say unto you, if you believe in me, you will do the works that I do and even greater works. Isn't that an amazing promise? Isn't it glorious that as charismatics, we get to believe in this and walk in this and work miracles and all of that? I love it. But listen to the full passage. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. So the very first thing he's saying in empowering us to walk in the earth is he's walking. The very first thing he goes to is you'll do this because I'm laying down my life and going to the Father. So if you're willing to lay down your life, you'll walk in all of this. Because I'm not only your Messiah, I'm your model. But I'm laying down my literal life to pay for sins so you can simply allow my Holy Spirit to come upon you because I've made you holy and now you can lay down your life to, but to come alive in me. And you'll do the works that I did because you're just as much a son as I'm a son. Galatians puts it this way in verse 220. The Apostle Paul says to the church, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live but Christ lives in me. So this isn't, I am crucified in Christ. I must go get my head chopped off for the gospel. And as Patricia always says, hey, if you have a literal martyr call, it won't be heavy. You'll rejoice in it. It'll be like Stephen. You know, it'll be like, I'm seeing the glory of God. They're chucking rocks at me. I had no idea, Lord. You're just so beautiful. Now, I'm not making light of what he accomplished, but I think about that. I read that passage sometimes and go, Lord, if it comes to that, I trust that I'll be in the glory. But he, it's not that, that we have to be called to that. Paul is saying, I love this. 
I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. What's he saying? My blood of martyrs has cried out. I've laid down my life. And because of that, Christ lives in me and I live in Christ. It's a glorious thing. See, just like Stephen in Acts is a picture of a literal martyrdom, how was it for him? Glory, you're beautiful, Lord. When we lay down our lives, according to Acts 1, 8 and John 20, and we let that be the blood of martyrs that cries out through us, it's not a heavy, it's glorious. It felt so much better to say yuck to murmuring and complaining and say, I know who I really am. That's the blood of martyrs in this season. Luke 9, 23 says, and he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So Jesus is saying, you want to know the recipe to walk in everything as your Messiah I've opened up for you? And as your mentor, I've shown you what it looks like. Come follow me. The key to it is take up your cross daily and die to yourself. Now notice he didn't say take up my cross daily. He said, take up our cross daily. What's the difference? Jesus literally laid down his life on the cross. Our cross is to metaphorically lay down our lives in everything we're talking about, to die to self and selfishness and everything that's not part of the solution, murmuring, complaining, fear, doubt, bitterness, giving place to the accuser of the brethren in the church. It's one of the biggest things that has to go. It's one of the biggest things we as the church must die for. I'm gonna take a little bunny trail because this is really important. It's a word you've heard me preach because I carried it for two years to lay a foundation globally for this and we're gonna see it come forth. But I had an encounter with an angel, first open night encounter I ever had with an angel was years ago in North Carolina. And it took me by surprise. I won't go into the whole story, I don't have time. But in this, I ended up having about It felt like about a 40-minute encounter, but you know when you're in the presence, it's just the present tenseness of I am. And all sorts of stuff happened. God shifted. I've been serving in Southeast Asia. He was shifting me to Europe. He gave me words for every nation in Europe, some of the capitals of Europe. I'm declaring them over in the spirit, showing me the powers and principalities that we need to deal with over the European continent. But one of the things that this came to is the Lord spoke to me about he wants revival that is sustained to the point of it becoming reformation in the nations. He actually challenged me, he said, don't only believe for revival. I want you to believe for revival in the churches that becomes reformation in the nations. And he said, I'm gonna give you keys to this. The keys to seeing a sustained revival in the church that will become reformation in the nation. He said, as I send you the first thing, I did this for like three years. It was basically what I did everywhere I went in ministry. Anoint the men and women who are willing to be Marys to birth this in intercession. That was key number one. He said, the second key is unity. And then he asked me a question. He said, do you want to know what my definition of unity is? And I, in my flesh, was thinking, God, I'm pretty good with words. I think I know what unity means. And then I realized, oh, sorry, Lord. Yes, your definition, absolutely. This is his definition that he gave me. This is the Lord speaking. So when I say I, I'm not talking about me. It's him. Believing that I am Lord is more than enough common ground for any of my children to meet upon. So when I was blessed to go someplace that didn't believe in the praying of tongues, it was not a point of division. I could be united with them. I didn't have to win the fight for tongues as for today. I simply needed to link arm in arm because we both believe Jesus Christ is Lord. I tell you what, denominational churches opened to me in that season like never before. And everywhere I went, everything I did was about honoring them for loving Jesus and lifting up their name. And what we didn't agree on didn't matter nearly as much as we knew Jesus Christ was Lord. And we saw the stirring of things and a gentle word, again, for us to carry in our hearts because I know you're all part of the solution already doing this and all of you, our beautiful Shiloh family. One of the things that we must be believing for for all of our brothers and sisters is really it's time to stop attacking one another and put that energy towards attacking Satan and his plans because there are things we disagree on. Hey, any of you who know me know I have a million opinions and I'll get fired up about every single one of them. But what I've learned is if I can meet someone in that enthusiasm and zeal, great. And what I'm learning is if it's not a common point, if they don't believe miracles are for today, it's not my job to prove them wrong. 
It's my job to find the common ground of how I can honor them for lifting up the name of Jesus Christ week in and week out. We need to start focusing on who we have in common as opposed to our differences of opinion about his word. That is one of the things that will bring healing to this land. And I'll say this again gently. You've heard me say it, but I'm repeating it because I know we are part of the solution and we're walking in this. One of the reasons there's so much discord, division, anger, and accusation out there in the world is because we've given place to it in the church. And we, we, have, we are going to stop it. We are going to be the solution. Those people are out in the streets, Antifa, BLM Inc., you name it, whoever it is out protesting there in open rebellion. You know what? We can point at them and say lawlessness. We can point at them and say this, say that. I see the enemy twisting beautiful hearts that want to go to war for really valid and important things. And I see the enemy twisting hearts into something ungodly. And you know what? Our job is, is to do two things. One, let's pray for every single one of them. I love praying for the leaders of Antifa and BLM Inc. I love praying for them because I know God can open their eyes and I know that every single one out in those streets that is rioting and being lawless, that they have beautiful hearts and they want to war for the disenfranchised, for the things that have been wrong that need to be made right. And we need to stand for them. I got sidetracked, but we really need to be praying for them because there are so many beautiful hearts that are gonna become champions for the gospel and in Christ bring real revival and reformation to things in America, as much as I love this nation, that it would be good to see healed and changed. The other thing we need to be aware of though is the reason there's that much discord out there and division out there is because we've allowed it in the church. We're the dominion stewards in the earth, not them. We shouldn't go to war against them. Stand for truth, but don't go to war against them. Go to war for them. Yes. Every single one can go from being a Saul to a Paul. And we can see real social justice break forth. Kingdom social justice. Anyway, sorry. But unity is such a key, and it's been missing in the church, but it's coming back because we are united in Christ, and we're going to walk in that unity. Luke 9, 23, and he was saying to them all, if, oh, I already did that one, sorry. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 through 20. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and the, that you are not your own? For you've been bought with a price, therefore glor to glorify God. Lay down our lives. How? Because we're a temple of who? The Holy Spirit. And what does he do? He comes upon us in power so that we can become martyrs. So we can lay down our lives and become part of the solution. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Oops, I keep repeating. Did I do that one? No, I didn't. Okay. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. I won't stay on this long because I already talked about it. Why would I want to operate as the old Robert? And every time I catch myself in that, praise God, Holy Spirit will come upon me and I can go, yuck. Yuck. Not me. I heard, I think it was uh, Dr. Clarice Fluitt say this once, and I think it's brilliant. It was so many years ago, but I'm almost positive it was her. Um, when we commune with our old nature, that's necromancy. Because our old nature's dead and buried in Christ. That's New Testament necromancy. We're not to commune with the dead. I'm not to be the old Robert. He's dead, and Holy Spirit will come upon me in power to remind me of that. Because the old Robert's not part of the solution, but the new Robert is. Amen. And then 1 Peter 1.16, one of my absolute favorite scriptures right now, because we're talking about heroic holiness and radicals of righteousness rising up, when um, uh, the invitation of the Lord, be holy for I am holy. This is dying to self. This is being, allowing Holy Spirit to, to empower us for us to become martyrs for Christ. Be holy for I am holy is not a hoop we have to jump through. It's not performance pressure. It's not a demand for blessing or relationship. It's an invitation in relationship to walk in the fullness of blessing and power we already have. God is not saying, be holy for I am holy or I shall smite thee. My whole problem with the United States of America is it's no longer holy so I'm gonna punish it. No, he's saying to my people, who are called by my name, if you will humble yourself, if you'll pray, if you'll seek my face, 
in all of that, I will empower you to turn from any wicked way because you are, be holy for I am holy is not a demand or a command. It's an invitation, an invitation to walk in the fullness of who we truly are. Jesus Christ absolutely died on the cross for his sins and his blood removes sins as far as the east is from the west. And we should and do get super excited about that. But that's what he did. We need to take it one step further. Why did he do it? Number one, because he loves us and what's relationship with us and he can't have, the holy can't have relationship with that which is not holy. But the other thing he was doing through this was repairing and rebuilding the temple because the Holy Spirit can't indwell the unholy. So he did what he did on the cross, yes, to restore us to relationship with the Heavenly Father in heaven, but in the earth to make a place where Holy Spirit could come and dwell. Why? Because when he does, the blood of martyrs cries out, Lord, I want nothing more than you. I don't want to walk in who I was. That's dead. That's buried. I want to be alive in you. And Lord, if there's ever anything that doesn't look and sound like you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're right here indwelling me, surrounding me, reminding me, discipling me, saying, hey, we both know that's not what you're really like. So I can say, ooh, you're right, yuck, thank you for pointing that out to me. That's not who I am, that's not gonna help. And I can shake it off, or I can go to my pastors and say, I kind of blew it, I wanna confess it out loud and help me remember who I really am so I can be part of the solution. That's the blood of martyrs. Do me a favor, rise to your feet. Everybody at home, rise to your feet. Father God, I wanna thank you that you have a room and a chat room, a studio, and a, 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 an internet filled with champions right now who are standing up before you and saying, thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're reminding me who I am. And Holy Spirit, we invite you every moment of every day and Lord, especially in this coming week, Holy Spirit, we invite you to come upon us in power. Absolutely, the power to, to, to evangelize, the power to preach, the power to reach the lost, the power to work miracles, the power to heal the sick, the power to cleanse the lepers, the power to raise the dead, the power to cast out demons. Yes and amen to all of it, Holy Spirit. But I thank you that part of that power that you give us is the power to be witnesses, to be martyrs for Jesus Christ. We declare, Lord, here we are. We have and we, we have laid down our lives and we pledge to you by your power, by your might, by your Holy Spirit, not by our strength, that we will continue to walk in the martyr's call, not as a burden, but as a joy. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you come upon us in power and joy to help us die to our old self and come fully alive in you and walk this out. That is the blood of martyrs crying out that will shift everything in this nation as we say yes to you, Holy Spirit, yes to righteousness, yes to holiness, yes to being sons and brides and living from that and arising and shining. Lord, thank you that you're breaking us free of any fear, any doubt, any distraction, any discouragement. Thank you, God, that you're giving us the power to praise when we don't feel like it, to pray when we don't want to, because that's the blood of martyrs crying out that you give us the power to do, to say, Lord, we know this is the solution, and you give us focus, and you give us determination, and you give us boldness to step out in it, especially when in our flesh we think, I don't wanna, what good could it do? We will arise and shine in you knowing this is the solution, this is the answer. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you come upon each and every one of us in power to go forth this week dead to our old carnal nature, fully and glorious, alive in you to make a difference, to be the solution, to see revival break out and reformation break out in us so it can be released through us. And we thank you, God, that you bless, you save, you revive, and you reform the United States of America and every nation in this world.